you're a man or know a man, you need to listen, man. Let's talk about true masculinity with Ken Harrison on Steve Brown, etc. He's an old white guy, an author, broadcaster, and seminary professor who's sick of religion. And he's brought friends. Please welcome Steve Brown, etc. And I am uh, Steve Brown, the aforementioned old white guy, feeling older today than I did yesterday. Why? After last night. Oh, he stayed up really late hard, last night. <laughs> that's hard work. We partied. And, oh, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm really tired today, and it's hard. <laughs> I feel a little feminine, by the way. <laughs> oh, good I grief. Talk about it. <laughs> Matthew Porter's here. Matthew had a proud dad moment this week when out of nowhere his 10-year-old started singing Journeys Don't Stop Believing. Yep. No joke. I don't even know. He, I didn't even know he was paying attention to when I'm playing the music. <laughs> then he starts humming it. I'm like, oh, oh, oh. Raise up a child in the way he should go. And, <laughs> and he will not waver from yeah. it. Yeah. That's clear. Our producer, Jinx, is working hard in the Luke Glass booth. Jinx, due to budget cuts, there's not a joke for you this week. <laughs> <laughs> and George Bingham is the president of Key Life. Dr. Bingham did a great introduction last night at the book launch party. Uh, it did get a little weird when he locked the doors and passed the offering plate. That's why he's Prob the president. Problem is, he locked them from the outside, and he's locked in the place, and he didn't make the talk show today. Why he's not here? I uh, know. He's counting the money. <laughs> there, <laughs> yeah, we didn't even have an offering. No, we didn't. Uh, we passed up an important... No, we didn't want it to be like church, so okay. we said no offering. Well, mm. it certainly wasn't like church. That's for sure. I think Kevin's introduction or roast of me when he said... I had published 20 books. He said, actually, 21. He wrote Genesis. <laughs> <laughs> that was the best line of the night. Yeah. That was so cool. That was a great line. And Kathy's the soft feminine side of this program. For the book launch party, she had a cake made to look like the cover of Talk the Walk, the book. It was the most fun <laughs> I've ever had. <laughs> Eating my own words. Ah, you didn't did even like eat I didn't any write cake. that. You wrote it, <laughs> and you ought to be ashamed of yourself. Uh, I regret uh, nothing. <gasps> Listen, our guest today is uh, one of my favorite people, Ken Harrison. He's chairman and president of Promise Keepers and CEO of Waterstone, an organization that helps clients give away millions of dollars each year in support of Christian humanitarian efforts. When they asked him to head up Promise Keepers, his friend said, are you crazy? Don't even think about that organization ain't going to make it. Well, if it makes it, and we're going to talk about it, uh, it's going to be because of Jesus and Ken. <laughs> uh, he has previously served as a police officer in L.A., I was a pastor, it's the same thing, <laughs> and spent nearly two decades in commercial real estate. Uh, his new book, which I hold in my nicotine-stained fingers, is uh, Rise of the Servant Kings, what the Bible says about being a man. Um, I doubt whether you're going to get many sales from Gillette. No. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, listen, Ken, welcome. Thank you for spending some time with us. Oh, thank you, brother. Listen, what what did you, did you just get tired of the feminization of the country and decide somebody ought to say something and you decided I'm going to say something? No, I wouldn't be that crazy. <laughs> <laughs> You've known me for 28 years. I knew you, and you were only kind of old. And I had hair. <laughs> you had hair. I think you still had the beard, though. Yeah, right. Uh, no, I was no, afraid to was... come on your show because I didn't want my voice to sound all high and squeaky compared to yours. 
Listen, when, seriously, uh, what what was it? The Promise Keepers thing that that was the genesis of you writing this book, or is this something that's been a passion of yours for a long time? And I'll tell you, uh, I'll tell you a great story between two Calvinists. This will be an interesting story. But as you know, Steve, um, I led an a international company, a large one, through the recession, and we did really well. And I retired at the old age of 45 and um, did all the stuff a Christian should do. I was teach- or got my daughter into Liberty University. Uh, I was coaching my son's football teams. This was back in 12. And I was praying in 2015, and God came to me in, in a vivid way and, and said, uh, I did not teach you everything I did and put you through everything I did so that you could ski and hike for the rest of your life. And it's a shock to have the Lord talk to you when you're a Reformed Baptist, because he's not supposed to talk to Baptists. But, <laughs> uh, uh, and I said, uh, Lord, what do you want me to do? And he said, are you willing to be as ambitious for my kingdom as you were for yours? And Whoa. it came with a real warning of count the cost. And uh, I said in a great fit of boldness, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I'm, I'm tired. And I... I, you know, I knew what that meant, and uh, ultimately I wrestled with him and uh, came out without the limp. But I said, uh, yeah, Lord, I will. And so I started leading men's discipleship groups all over Colorado and gaining a lot of influence. And at that point, God really convicted me to put that into a book. This was pre-Promise Keepers. And uh-huh. um, I met with an agent, and um, the agent said, you know, the problem is, Ken, nobody reads men's books. And so we'll do what we can. And at that time, my wife and I prayed about it and agreed that we'd give away all the money from the book, even though at that time we thought there wouldn't be any money. And then ultimately, Promise Keepers came along. It was forced into my lap, and a bidding war ensued between a bunch of um, publishers, and the amount got bid three times higher than we ever thought would be the greatest home run we could hit. And we gave all that money away, and I wrote the book, and then Promise Keepers launched along with the book. So. Lord really kind of put both paths along at the same time. And I've learned to walk in John 3, 8, uh, when Jesus tells Nicodemus, the wind blows where it will, and you hear it, where it comes from, or, but you don't know where it comes from or where it's going. So it is it with everyone born of the Spirit. And I've learned just to walk in the present with the Lord because I never know what tomorrow's going to bring. Tell us about Promise Keepers. I, uh, you know, we all know that movement and the major impact that it had. And, um, you know, that final rally in Washington with those hundreds of thousands of men. Matthew and I were talking this morning about uh, a number of women who wanted to protest promise keepers, took their blouses and bras off and stood in front of them. And the men, God bless them, turned their back. And I said to one of those men, I was so proud of you. And he said, it wasn't hard. <laughs> <laughs> hey, uh, we'll probably take that out of this when we post it. <laughs> but uh, what is? tell us what's happening with Promise Keepers. Man, it's awesome. Um, another you know, moment with the Lord, but essentially... Uh, to, a long story short, I went on the board only to help a friend out, and when I saw the mess that was Promise Keepers, I yelled at the board um, for the state of things, and so they voted me chairman. And, uh, <laughs> and That'll I, teach you. To teach you to keep your mouth <laughs> shut. I still haven't learned. <laughs> and uh, I brought it into the foundation here, Waterstone, to close it down. Um, paid off all the debts, paid off every contractor from 10 years earlier, uh, made it all correct, and then God really showed us uh, in a really a miraculous way his plan was for us to relaunch Promise Keepers. And so what we had to do was really understand what is Promise Keepers, what is its identity, and its identity is 70,000 men in an NFL stadium. Mm. And as it faded down into arenas and then big churches, that wasn't Promise Keepers because the thing you hear, and, and Steve, I've heard um, hundreds of men have told me this, some in tears, the feeling of hearing 70,000 guys sing Amazing Grace together is something that you just can't replicate. Um, and it's not just about the singing. It's funny, when you hear people just go on and on about promise keepers, they never talk about the speakers. And if you ask them, they'll say, oh, they were awesome. Tony Evans, oh, my gosh, how amazing. Um, Evie Hill, amazing yeah. guy. But it's the singing, and I think what they're really talking about is the purity of worship 
And it's one of those few moments in their lives where men were really authentic and real, and they repented in tears. The other thing I've heard is from guys in their late 30s to mid 40s about how their dads brought them when they were teenagers. And they were so stricken. It was the best weekend they ever spent with their dad because it was the first time their dad told them he loved them. It was the first time they saw their dad truly vulnerable, and it brought them closer together. And they said, Ken, I, I so desperately want to bring my son to that. So we are going to be at AT&T Stadium in Dallas, home of the Dallas Cowboys, on uh, uh, July 31st and August 1st of 2020. So a year and a few months. Mm. Tickets won't go on sale for a few more months. But we're going to be back, 80,000 guys in Dallas Cowboys Stadium. You are uh, talking to people all over the country, aren't you? Oh, yeah. It's been amazing, the reception that we're getting. I've, I've just been floored. Wow. Our guest is Ken Harrison in his book, The Rise of the Servant Kings. Uh, what the Bible says, really, now about being a man. Boy, is he going to be criticized. So, uh, it might help if you said a prayer for Ken on occasion. Um, he's mean enough himself, but. <laughs> You know, even the strongest man can cave in the face of some heavy criticism. We'll talk about that on the other side of the break. And there is a break. we got to pay for this. And, but like Jesus, we're coming back. So don't go away. glad that you're with us. You always have a place at our table. We're talking with Ken Harrison and his book, The Rise of the Servant Kings, What the Bible Says About Being a Man. Ken, this is Matthew. Uh, we're going to you know, dive into the heart of, of the book, but I, I wanted to step back just for a second because I know the content of the book is colored significantly by your own personal experiences. And <laughs> They're kind of really diverse. I mean, from from uh, L.A. Comp and if I'm remembering correctly, Watts or Compton or th that area, and then right. businessman. I was just wondering if you could kind of give us a broad view of kind of what your life has been in in, in specifically. Is there any kind of through line? Is there any kind of common thread to these very diverse um, things that you've been involved with throughout your life? Yeah, well, I truly believe that God has really been, um, he has a plan for each one of us. In Ephesians 2.10, that we're God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which were prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And I believe um, we all have a plan that we can uh, bring about of good works after our salvation if we avoid sin and are sanctified and walk in Christ. So, yeah, the, you know, the line was, my dad was an L.A. cop uh, in Watts, and in the Watts riots he was shot and moved us up to Oregon uh, to raise us for the rest of, of my life. And when I got 21, I went back to, to L.A. and became a cop. And after all the L.A. Rodney King stuff, um, I left there and got into business and really didn't know what to do um, after I left the LAPD. In fact, Steve was a key in that, Steve Brown. Um, I'd written him some letters after leaving the LAPD and saying I didn't know what I should do, et cetera, et cetera. And he was so gracious, and this was before email, and, um, going back and forth and giving me advice. And I got on my knees and claimed the promise of James 1.5. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask his Father in heaven who gives generously. And really, uh, God really answers desperate prayers from desperate people, broken people. And, and um, when I asked for wisdom, I was broken, and he answered that and just gave me supernatural business wisdom just out of the blue. And uh, so within five years, um, I had started as a brand-new trainee. Uh, I was a partner in the biggest firm in America. Five more years, I was the CEO because my office had really taken over the rest of the company and then sold us to a large international company and then ran um, their valuation company for six years. And so what I learned through all that is the nature of people, and I saw the consequences of sin. It was not just in the ghetto. I didn't just see the horrific death, torture, and uh, all that stuff. But then in business, I saw that that evil men don't just wear um, gang colors. They also wear suits and ties. 
uh, the depravity of men. And that's why I have such little patience for sin and the consequences of it. And Steve's message of grace really rescued me from the legalistic way in which I'd been raised. Uh, but I've also seen that their grace requires repentance. Um, people who in, live in known rebellious sin and insist on God's grace are missing the mark. And I think um, Jesus' parables of Matthew 25 make that pretty clear. That's what I wanted to get through in this book. I think that the message of grace has been so distorted. God loves us with everything in him. But if we want true life and joy and power in him, man, we've got to walk away from our sin and die to our rights to ourselves. Mm. And we can't do that by ourselves either. Hey, listen, right. what's, a, what's a servant king? Well, you know, every man's called to be a king um, in his own sphere. That means to be accountable for those around him. So a single man stands up for the rights of women. He defends the bullied. He, uh, as, as Isaiah 1 says, he stands up for justice. He cares for the poor and the oppressed, and he's jealous for God's name. Um, single man, or excuse me, a married man is that way with his wife and with his kids. But emphasis on servant. Um, God tells us in Ephesians 5.25, men love your wives as Christ loved the church. Well, how did, how did Christ love the church? He was tortured to death for her. He gave up every right to himself to present her blameless and spotless to his Father in heaven. And that needs to be our attitude with our wives and with our kids. We're accountable for the spiritual state of our families, not to blame because they don't always follow us, but we're accountable to be the kind of men that our wives choose to follow and that teach them God's word. Ken, that, you know, when you say that, I go, but of course. And, uh, <laughs> But, but not everybody says, but of course, as you know, the whole Promise Keepers movement was criticized throughout its history. And even now, as you resurrect it, you're putting yourself uh, uh, on the firing range as a target, not the one shooting. Um, where does, where does, I mean, how can somebody say that what you said is not a good thing? I mean, it sounds like... Every man in the world uh, ought to rise up and call you blessed. But more important than that, every woman in the world ought to rise up and call you blessed. What's the problem? Satan. <laughs> Satan has been about his business for a long time. Being raised in the church, I really wondered, well, who is the devil and why does he do what he does? And no one really ever explained it. I put a chapter in this, in this book about um, the liar. And what he desperately wants to do is separate us from the image of God. And the image of God is a fully masculine man and a fully feminine woman together as one. And, and nobody's perfect, so we're never the perfect representation of God. But God is not a man. He's not a woman. He says to think of him as male. But he is, that, that is the representation of his image. So if he can destroy our perception of masculinity, then he can destroy how we perceive God. And that's what we see happening. We see in churches a feckless God who's sitting on the edge of his seat begging us not to sin, but if we do, well, he's fine with it anyway. And that's not what I really read in Revelation 21.8. It's not what I see in Hebrews um, 10.31 where it says it's a terrible thing to fall into the hands of the living God, and he's talking to believers. So we have to understand he loves us desperately, but ultimately, if we've lived our lives in rebellion and disbelief, there are going to be some consequences to that. And it's our job as men to speak the truth boldly and to rescue people from Satan's lies in his hands. And we're not doing a very good job of it. That's true. I, uh, you know, our culture, you might want to speak to that a little bit. Our culture has really gotten um, dark and scary and divisive and hateful and uh, elitist and, uh, and angry. Uh, you want to comment on that a bit? You... You expect promise keepers to make a difference in our culture, don't you? Yeah. And John Stone Street says uh, what was unthinkable 10 years ago is unquestionable today. And um, you said something as we were going to the break that's very important. If we're successful, and we will be, then the, the amount of our success will be directly proportional to how hated I am. And uh, during the Kavanaugh hearings, my wife and I were, who she's a very godly, strong woman, you know her, I looked at her and said, baby, um, if we pull off what we say we're going to, there goes me in two years. Are you ready? Said, how can I not be? When I look at the suicide and the pain in people's faces, how can I not give up our lives? 
Oh, man. That's heavy. Our guest uh, is Ken Harrison from cop to ministry leader. Uh, and in between, he made a lot of money, uh, <laughs> <laughs> which is what everybody knows is what's important about this thing. Uh, no, it's not. It's about Jesus. The name of the book, The Rise of the Servant Kings, what the Bible says about being a man. We're just beginning. Don't you go anywhere. Um, we're going to come back after we have some milk and cookies. The most dangerous thing about the Christian faith, for those who believe it, is the danger of being right. The feeling that we've been given a license to pummel people with the truth, believers and unbelievers alike. In fact, if believers don't learn to live and speak right when we get it right, it's gonna kill us and everything we love. You know it's true. Some of the meanest, most condemning, and arrogant people on the face of the earth are Christians. I know because I'm one of them. That makes me an expert. I didn't write this book to correct you. I wrote it for me. But who knows, maybe God will get to you too, and then use us both to change the world. Etc. Ken Harrison's hanging out with us. You can go to riseoftheservantkings.com. You can learn more about the book. You can't cover this, the topics in this book in an hour, so you ought to go and check it out. And also, if you go there, you can get a chapter for free, riseoftheservantkings.com. And you can also follow Ken on Twitter at Ken R. Harrison. Ken, it's Kathy. Um, I would like, if you would, to uh, talk a little bit about um, the distinction between leadership and authority. Um, and is this something that the church gets wrong uh, sometimes about being a man? Um, I'm part of a um, I'm part of a denomination that's pretty male centered, and and I am a believer in male authority. But in this particular denomination, I mean, you know, the women basically can teach the children and work in the nursery and they can teach the women's groups. But anything over and above that, um, you pretty much not. And I think there was a perception back in the heyday, uh, so to speak, of promise keepers, and, which I don't, by the way, I don't think was correct. But I think there was a misperception that that was some of the way that um, that the men who were involved in Promise Keepers also felt. Would that be, um, I, I realize that I'm asking that question, and I, and I want to say I don't necessarily think that that was a fair um, analysis of that, but I do think a lot of women felt that way. Let me try to answer your question as <laughs> pithy as I can, although it might take me a minute. Uh, on the Promise Keepers side, no. In fact, Jack Hayford was on the board of Promise Keepers back in the 90s, and he was certainly a proponent of women. Um, so that's not true. Okay. And just as an aside, let me say, um, Steve, you brought up the, the pr protesters back in the day. I think we'll have far more now. And uh, what I learned when I was raised as, as, uh, under Stu Weber's teaching, he was my pastor up in Oregon, um, what we're going to do is not ignore the women this time. What we want to have is thousands of godly women there with them because it's a great mission field. I think we're going to have a couple thousand protesters and, man, it takes a lot of hatred and anger to 
to walk around outside in Dallas in July. <laughs> and, uh, so that's a dedication there. And I don't want to see a man within a mile of those women, but what I want to see is thousands of godly women leading them to Christ. We're going to set up misters to keep them comfortable and stay in the shade. We're going to serve them cold drinks because they've been wounded, and they've, and they've been wounded by men, and they have a right to be angry. And what we want to do is turn that bitterness and that anger towards the grace of Jesus Christ and let them know that just because men have treated them horribly in the past doesn't make them representative of all, all men, and certainly not the men of God. Um, leadership uh, versus authority. The problem that we have because of Satan, because of our sinful nature, is that we inherently want to control others. We want to put others and make them be like we are. I mean, so many people in the church have these fantasies, if only somebody made me king, everything would work around here. And um, we've seen what happens when even you make the greatest minds in the world king, Alexander the Great I talk about in the book, what a brilliant man, but what did he do? He murdered and slaughtered, and we've just got a whole scripture full of stories of what happens when we make somebody king. So um, God tells us to lead our wives, not to be in authority over our wives. And he tells our wives to submit to us, not to obey us. And those are very distinctive and important words. One of the things we see with the godless is they like to change words to make them suit their own. That's the whole politically correct movement. And so what I talk about in the book is that authority is what a police officer has or a military commander. Get out of your car, show me your registration, and we, we obey out of fear of punishment. Submission requires equality. Submission requires choice. And God is telling women to choose to follow their husbands, which puts the onus on the husband to be a man worth following. So as a husband, how are you leading your wife? And what I found with great leaders is that they're strong on empathy, and they're strong on making room for people to flourish in their space. So a great leader says, Here, here's the space, and, and be, be who we say we are as a family. A leader says, our family, like the jailer in Acts, as for me and my family, we will follow the Lord. That's who we are as a family. Our wives, we give them great. Uh, we build them up. I mean, we're supposed to lay down our lives for our wives. Coach Bill McCartney said it perfectly. He said, the best thing a man can do for his kids is to love their mother. That's a great quote. Hmm. That's great. Well, you know, it's funny when this, uh, you talk about marriage, but in the larger picture of, of, of family, you know, when this airs, it's we're just a matter of days away from uh, Father's Day. Um, I'd imagine you had some some insights and advice for fathers, how to be better fathers. I, I know that one of the very common um problems for men probably i don't know if it's especially for christian men or not is is being passive is 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 not being engaged in your family the way you should uh any thoughts on that any 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 words of wisdom from your experience now now ken i'm gonna let you start hmm. but you're not gonna be able to give a full answer because the break's coming so give a one sentence sort of like teaser <laughs> for what you're going to say to Matthew, and then we'll take a break, and we'll come back, and your gun will be loaded, and you can speak to the issue. Give me a teaser. You want to, you want to be a great father and a great husband. Learn to be empathetic. Put yourself in their shoes and walk around them for a while. All right. We will pursue that on the other side of the great because on the other side of the break, it's the microphone. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we will pursue it because we are promise keepers, okay? So don't go anywhere. This is good stuff. The name of the book is The Rise of the Servant Kings, what the Bible says about being a man. Don't go anywhere. Harrison, the rise of the servant kings, what the Bible says about being a man. If you uh, are part of a men's group and uh, you're looking for something to maybe uh, cover, this would be a great book uh, to be to study. It is, in, as you've listened to Ken, you've heard him quote scripture uh, every other sentence. So this is a biblical book and it's an important book. 
Ken, this is Matthew. Before the break, uh, you know, you had been talking about marriage, and you know, I was segueing into uh, you know advice for uh, men who are fathers. Um, I'm just asking this selfishly. I have four babies, and it's been good up to this point, but we're headed headlong into teenagehood. I know it's about to be a lot less Instagrammable. Uh, so uh, <laughs> you had mentioned a, a key thing to keep in mind for fathers is the quality of empathy. Tell me more about that. Yeah, here's where um, when the book um, was ready, the, the publisher team, they really put a lot out of this. They're really grateful to Waterbrook Multnomah. But they did say we feel like we should have a PG-13 rating on this book because Christian books are not written this way. It's, these stories are very direct. Some of them are violent, you know, cop stories, and the, the truths are direct. And so what I'm about to say is a little PG, not a lot, but just, you know, fair warning. But um, we as men need to learn to empathize with our wives because we have bodies that basically never change. Um, the only time our bodies ever went through a significant change was when we were 12 and we went through puberty and we got bigger and stronger and faster. That was all good. Um, for women, their bodies are changing all the time. Um, and puberty can be a very traumatic time, even for a girl, when you think about all the boys she you know, grew up playing with and stuff, start looking at her different, and suddenly they're stronger than her and she was wondering what happened. And then the beginning of the menstrual cycle, and then every month the woman's body's changing, and then in pregnancy, we think about the change there. And then finally menopause, where a woman, and a lot of their identity is tied up in having kids. Um, they lose the ability officially to have kids, whereas a man never loses that ability. So we really need to empathize with our wives, and it really distresses me when I hear men, even Christian men, you know, making jokes about women are crazy and this and that. It goes to show they're absolutely not paying attention to what's going on with their wives. The other idea then comes with sex, um, intimacy in a marriage. Um, for, a, for a man, there is zero natural consequence to intimacy, which is um, a man can gratify himself and run off into the wind and never be seen again. For a woman, you think about every intimate relationship is a life-altering potential moment. It's kids. It is uh, that. But also just in nature, you know, many women die in pregnancy, in childbirth. And so we think about the perception we have about that and intimacy versus our wives. And if we started to pay attention to how she's feeling, how she's doing, we'd start to understand, and I go into this in the book, um, the different perceptions we have around that issue. Because the number one issue I get, and I talk to hundreds of men a month, number one thing I, you, know, you hear is uh, a lack of intimacy to the, to the point that they'd like it to be. And I tell them, if you're the kind of husband that empathizes with your wife and is the kind of person who is worth following, if you're the kind of guy that understands that safety and protection and being cherished are, are the number one issues for a healthy-minded woman, and so when she knows that you're looking at pornography or you have a wandering eye or you're watching questionable movies, how do you cherish do you think she feels by you? How much do you think she feels she is the sole object of your intimate um, desires? You make her feel that way, and I guarantee you won't have that complaint unless there's some bitterness or something in your marriage. Yeah, that's really interesting. That's kind of like instead of just reacting to what's going on, take a minute, take in the larger context of what's going on. Um, that, that seems like that's something that might even tie back to your um, cop days of trying to assess a situation and not just assess what's going on immediately, but kind of that more broad context before reacting. Right, we brought up passivity. What a what a boy does, and we talk, you know, toxic masculinity. Toxic. There's nothing masculine about toxic masculinity. That's just men acting like children. Mm. And so you think about how a mature leader of a man acts. Well, let's talk about just the intimate part of marriage. If it's not quite working out how he wants a passive man pouts and whines, or starts an argument, an active man says, "Gee, things don't seem to be aligned here. What do I need to do to align them?" That's what a leader does, and that's the kind of man a woman can respect. So interesting. I was thinking about the, the kind of the movie archetype of uh, the bad boy and how that's like kind of like turned into this romantic thing. It, it's funny because the problem is not the bad. The problem is the boy. <laughs> the problem, that's right. <laughs> you're, 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 a boy in a man's body. Yeah. Many of those. That's a, that creates a lot of problems. Uh, do you uh, say something about kids? Love their mother. Well, if you don't want to, you don't have to. <laughs> well, it's just it's such a it's such a, a difficult issue. I will say this: I was talking to a, a, a megachurch pastor. He was complaining to me about his um, people, 
and millennials, I hear this all the time too, unfairly. And he was saying, um, you know, millennials, 47% of them in this new recent survey say it's wrong to share their faith. And 50% of them, Christian evangelical millennials, um, believe that gay marriage is okay. And I said, well, it's because their dads didn't teach them scripture. And he got very angry with me. I mean, really, really agitated and upset. My son told me one time, you know, Dad, it's a good thing that God made you so big, because otherwise someone would <laughs> beat you up. <laughs> but uh, I told him that, and I said, absolutely. I mean, if you think it's wrong to share your faith, you clearly don't understand God's Word. If you think that homosexual marriage is fine within a church, you clearly don't have lots of different passages in your Bible. That's because their fathers didn't take the responsibility and accountability to teach their kids God's Word. We have outsourced the education of our children to public schools, into churches, which may or may not be teaching them God's Word. It's our responsibility. Sit down, and boy, I tell you what, the best way to teach is to listen. Ask them what they're doing, what they're learning. Ask them how that coincides with Scripture. Maybe ask them to read you a couple of Bible verses. And, of course, the key to everything I just said is you actually have to know the Bible to be able to do that. And that's your responsibility as a man to know the Bible. Too many women are the spiritual leaders in the church today, and it's a sad thing. You know, it's interesting you're saying about what the Bible's view of masculinity and sexuality is, and it seems so out of phase with where popular culture and marketing is today. And you can very easily get to a point where you feel like, am I the oddball? I feel completely isolated. I feel completely uh, estranged from where culture seems to be right now. But I think that goes full circle back to one of the qualities of the Promise Keepers movement. One that you didn't say specifically, just the idea of like, Hey, I'm not alone. I'm not exactly out right. here by myself. Yeah. yeah. Ken, exactly. we gotta land this plane. I don't know where this hour went. You uh you've done a good thing in writing this book. I would have some advice for you. I wish you'd learn to say what you think <laughs> and 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 be a little bit more proactive than you are. You are way too passive and yeah. and laid back. Yeah. And if you try to fix that, God will use you. I just want you to know that. <laughs> you know, Can't... Steve, you say that in jest. I hear that so much. I hear I hear so many people with their worldly wisdom lining up to tell me that I shouldn't be so direct and I should be more like everybody else and not really say anything worthwhile. Oh. Um, and maybe I'd be more popular. Ken, this is from Sinai. And I would say it in Hebrew, but you don't know Hebrew. <laughs> so don't you shilly shally, okay? And uh, you, keep brother. doing what you're doing, and we'll look forward to what God does with this new promise keepers. The name of the book, Rise of the Servant Kings, What the Bible Says About Being a Man. And guys, we have a short segment coming up, and we'll tell you whoever we're going to do it unto next week. So don't go away. And by the way, if you uh, if you want to use this in a study group in your church, this book, The Rise of the Servant Kings, if you go to that website, uh, riseoftheservantkings.com, uh, you, you can download a study guide, and you can download it free, and uh, it'll help you uh, with your small group. Great, great hour. The thing that I see as key as where Ken is coming from is the empathy thing. Um, you know, you feel like he's going to speak truth, but you feel like he understands that it's hard. I think what he said about women was so incredibly sensitive and aware of where women are. And so often men are not that way. We, we do our own thing and, uh, you know, when we, uh, try to read women that they're like us and they're not. And his sensitivity to kids and to the culture, to the reality of it without being angry about it, but speaking truth is a really good thing. And you're going to hear a lot more from Ken and you're going to hear a lot more from Promise Keepers in the, in the future. 70,000. I had a friend that said the most obvious thing about promise keepers was 
they got out of the house without their wives telling them what to wear. <laughs> that was a bunch of scuzzy looking guys in those stadiums. Well, Catherine, who's going to be here next week? You know, I do like to let you know when I work exceptionally hard on a guest, and and I've worked exceptionally, exceptionally hard on the guest for this next week coming up. And I'm pleased to report that Steve Brown and his new book will be with. Oh, wait, we already did that. Okay, no, we don't have anybody for next week. Um, maybe we'll talk up to Steve Brown about his new book again. Yeah, we're riding a no, high here after the book launch party. No, we've talked all we're going to talk about. What's the name of that book? Talk the Walk. Talk the How Walk. How to be right without being insufferable. Although Ooh. some people think that it's. It's the same as his previous book years ago, How to Talk So People Will Listen, just with a new cover. Love, love. Love, yeah, love. I thought that was pretty rude myself. <laughs> but, you know, but you know, some people think that. But you know what? It's a good way to get people to buy the book because then they'll find out that that's wrong. So actually, all that to say, we're not really sure what we're doing next week, but we'll be stellar because we always are. It isn't going to be me. I just want you to know that. <laughs> okay. I, I'm old. I'm going to be taking a nap. Isn't that the truth? I'm tired of talking about this book. Although, it's one of the truly great works of Christendom. Keylife.org. Keylife needs the money. Right. (laughs) Tell your friends. We're we're out of here, but we're going to come back next week, same time, same place. Between now and then, don't do anything we wouldn't. And that gives you a wide, wide berth.